give you some of uh, the uh, basic background on Fred, the statistics, and then uh, maybe I'll get Bob Kurtz up here, who's, who's very connected with uh, Fred's life, too, and we'll tell some stories. So, Fred was born in 1928, and he died in 2018. That's 90 years. <coughs> and he was still drawing at the end of those 90 years. He was born in Flint, Michigan, to a farm and machinery family, but his father had a little side job of doing illustrations, um, and which they used a lot in newspapers. The photography was at its advanced as it was later on. And Fred had all those drawings in his house um, around his kitchen area. Beautiful, tight drawings, um, all with ink. Um, Fred went to Michigan State and he loved it there. He loved the whole college atmosphere and he always followed the basketball and the football and all of it the rest of his life. He went back to Michigan State at about 80 and they had a Fred Crippen day for him. He was the, uh, the editor, the cartoon editor of the, uh, the Michigan Spartan uh, newspaper too. Um, halfway through his uh, career at Michigan State, um, he turned 18 and he joined the Marine Corps. World War II was just ending. Uh, they made him a forward observer, and uh, forward observers don't last too long. They're out in front of the rest of the troops trying to find out where the other troops are and then radio back. Luckily, Fred was in the Marine Corps between World War II and Korea, so he never had to be under enemy fire. Um, when he got out, he went back to Michigan State, finished, and then got a job uh, at Jam Handy. But I learned later in our relationship, uh, friendship, that um, he graduated uh, as a fine artist. And his instructor at Michigan State was uh, Charles Pollock, Jackson Pollock's older brother. So Fred met Jackson a few years later, in the very early 50s, when he moved to New York after he uh, finished with Jam Handy. Fred wanted to be a, like all of us, a New Yorker cartoonist. And he made a serious try at it, but it's just uh, going up to the uh, New Yorker offices on Wednesday afternoon and sitting with 20 other cartoonists to see if you can sell them a drawing. Meanwhile, um, he got a, an appointment to uh, talk to the people at UPA. The UPA had just opened in New York a commercial division to pick up some of the TV commercial work, and they pulled Fred in there. And uh, he had never animated before, but uh, between George Singer and uh, Dwayne Crowder and some of the fellas, uh, they had him going pretty soon. Um, Fred then moved out when they closed that uh, unit and joined the UPA main unit here in Los Angeles. And uh, he worked with Jimmy Murakami. And they did a lot of sh for the TV show, the UPA TV show. Which I remember the young teenager hanging around on Sunday afternoon so I could see the show. Uh, the other kids were out playing. Um, and then when they closed UPA, Fred uh, opened uh, uh, his own company called Pantomime Pictures in 1958. And um, I think they sold Pantomime, they sold the building, they still own the name in 2018. So that was a long run for a show. And um, Bob worked for Panto on the first big job they had, Roger Ramsey. I was in the service at that time and I got back too late, but I, I got to go to work when they were doing Sesame Streets. And uh, it was myself and Floyd Norman sitting upstairs, uh, and Fred every half day would bring us another storyboard, which I'd pound and stuff out, because it wasn't much money, so we had to move. Um, Fred did a lot of uh, tremendous animation work. Um, I guess the first thing I saw that he did was when I was still in at Chenard in school, and I saw a short film called um, Why Man Creates by Saul Bass, but the middle of that film is a five-minute film called The Edifice. It's one long vertical pan, uh, starting here, and two little men keep building, and keep building, and it, the architecture changes as we come forward in time. I won't tell you the rest of it, but go to YouTube tonight and uh, type in The Edifice, and it's still there, along with an awful lot of Fred's work. And that's kind of a nice thing about YouTube. Um, let me see what else do I want to 
get, um, well, he just did sketches his whole life. And once I started visiting him, I don't think I ever went to his home until I was retired, too. And as it turned out, I moved to Canoga Park, and that's where Fred lived. So I started going over to his house, watching ball games and visiting. Uh, and that's when I saw all of the oil and acrylic work he'd done, watercolors and the stacks of the stuff. Um, so we both put together a show, in which we had here, I think, in 2016. I put up about six or seven of my watercolors and about 40 of Fred's work. And he sold some, and some friends came to see the show, because that friend had never exhibited. They came to see the show, people that uh, Fred thought had passed, but they were old friends, and somehow the word got out. So it was a chance for him to do a reunion with a lot of old friends. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say to bring you up to the stories, because there's lots of stories about Fred. Um, you, have you got one, Bob, you like to talk? Maybe. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Uh, uh, on Oedipus, before I start talking about uh, Grit, on Oedipus, there's some great lines that the Victorian monks are going through, uh, and they're saying, what do you do when you get to the end of the world? You fall off. <laughs> <laughs> and when he invented you know, mathematics, he says, I invented the zero. He said, what? Many, many, many. <laughs> <laughs> Crip uh, drew outrageous ca uh, characters, and Crip was an outrageous character. Um, I remember hearing about him. You know, he uh, at UPA out here, he shared a room with Bertie Chandoff and Jimmy Murakami. So it was a race to do two-headed characters with sharp teeth. You know, they were never flat. You know, and it was just wonderfully cutting and. Uh, the work that all of them were doing, but uh, Fred was his own. And I met Fred through uh, his 60s now, parties. Uh, <coughs> lots of lots of parties. <coughs> Jimmy Murakami, Fred Wood, George Singer, and I tended to go to the same parties. And there was always a lot of alcohol. And most people could hold their liquor. Fred couldn't. <laughs> Fred was that the classic sloppy drunk. And I remember my vision that you know, we'd be a whole bunch of us, like four or six guys on front lawns, trying to chase Fred down. Fred was very athletic. <laughs> trying to get the keys away from him so he wouldn't drive home. Uh, but uh, And then I... I have to say well, a couple more things. Uh, we, were, we were good friends, and one time I lived in Woodland Hills, and right behind me was a road that went up to a golf course, and they have on the 4th of July, they used to invite the neighbors to uh, uh, come and, and enjoy the show. And of course, it's great because you take a blanket, you look up, it's right above you. So I invited Fred Wolf uh, and his wife, uh, Chicky, uh, and uh, Fred Griffin and his wife and uh, my wife, when we went there, they changed the rules. And right at the beginning it said, do you have a membership card? And Fred was so great. He says, I have a membership card to every golf club. And he pushed the guy aside and we all followed him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we thought, um, working with Fred, uh, it was the first time I worked with him was on the Roger Ranch. I think I might have done a commercial before. before uh, he was a great boss because he just, he went away. You know, he was there for a couple of the weeks and he went to play golf. And he relied on the people he hired to, you know, to make these films. We had no budget. I mean, they were really, we could only use a walk cycle every fourth film. And uh, what happened was, uh, Crip came up with this technique, basically, of someone talks, you cut to the door, he talks, and then, basically, then the guy's there. Nobody ever walks. Cut, 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 cut. And so when I came on, I started cutting faster than Crip. So then Crip started cutting faster than me. <laughs> then I cut faster than him, and then Crip went and played golf. Uh, uh, his place was perfect for an artist. Artist run, uh, uh, it was two buildings right across from uh, Hanover uh, and, the, and the parking lot in between. And every day you could find, in, probably in the afternoon, people came by 
I visited, Fred always took a uh, lot uh, time off. There was a chess game going on with the animators or whoever downstairs always. And Dwayne Crowder would always stop by and play chess. I mean, Craig was such a wonderful character, a great talent, and uh, I mean, just we really miss him. Yeah, um, the first time I ever saw Fred was I was just out of art school and I was carrying out a worn out little portfolio. And I called and made an appointment to see him, and the next week, and I went up, and he had a studio was on the Sunset Boulevard. Yeah. Kind of above, above the boulevard. And I went in, there was no one in the outer office, and I thought I heard something inside, so I called out. He came out, he had a golf bag. <laughs> and I said, I'm here to see Fred Crippen. He says, that's me. I said, Dave, I got a portfolio, we're going to take a look at it. So, God, is that today? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the only thing I ever learned about Fred. Is that, is that today? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, uh, please check out Roger Ramjet if you have I think this crowd probably knows about Roger Ramjet. <laughs> um, okay. I'll go to the last story. All right, okay. Um, yeah, he had a very tender, sentimental, and honest side to him. And um, I'll tell you a story about we were golfing up in Santa Barbara. And uh, we were, it's a nice cold break, and I'm getting a sandwich, and Fred has already gotten his. He's watching the uh, action on the ninth hole, or waiting to go to the tenth hole. And uh, I see Fred watching a woman, young woman, good looking woman, pulling a golf cart and walking up the course. And he looked very intently at her. I thought to myself, Fred really doesn't look leer at women the way he's doing that. What's going on? So I get there, I didn't say anything about it, and I sat down and he says, you see that woman walking up that golf course? And I said, yeah, yeah, what about her? He said, that's exactly what Julie, my wife, looked like the first time I saw her in Michigan State. Thank you.